Hello, everyone. This video is to go through the questions stump the professor. And we had some great questions from all our teams. In this video, I'm going to address all the team's questions. And some of the questions are a little bit longer than others. And other ones uh, really encapsulate a lot of patterns, I notice. Uh, I have taken extensive notes to get ready to answer your questions. Uh, to make it easier to watch a video that might end up going a little bit longer, uh, I put in time codes and chapters in the YouTube notes. So um, you can go ahead and click where you might want to be if you don't uh, to manage your time. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead uh, and extemporaneously uh, go ahead and start going through some of these questions. So my first team, the Summer Bummers. Hello, Summer Bummers. Thank you for your great questions. And thank you particularly for asking a question about water, because as we know, uh, I study water. That's what my PhD is in conflict resolution and management over water issues. Spe specifically, I study water bottling and groundwater uh, and tribal uh, laws and tribal rights. Uh, so, one of the que the question is how does how can Kinefin help us better understand the water crisis or writer, the water crisis in relationship to Kinefin? Well, water crisis is so big and broad. We're going to have to shrink that down. For example, in my dissertation, I do a whole chapter on Kinefin and and water, and I'm applying it to Nestle water. American Water Company, when they came to Oregon to build a water bottling company uh, plant in Cascade Locks. And it ensued an eight year uh, battle uh, with tribes and different activist groups and local communities, uh, despite getting the go ahead for doing a water rights transfer from the governor's office. And this was um, back in 2015, or, no, not 2015. I'm sorry, that's towards the end of it. Uh, back in 2008, I think is when they were first starting to apply for their uh, water transfer rights. So I used the Kinefin to actually examine Nestle as a corporation and organization and their response to what happened uh, when they reached, uh, when they tipped over into the cliff of chaos um, of dealing with um, uh, how to keep going ahead with their plans. So to answer the question though, I think uh, what I'd like to do is just really look, think about the United States of America, uh, particularly the mainland here and the failing infrastructure of water uh, that is happening throughout the United States. And Flint, Michigan is probably one of the biggest cases of this uh, where we had the water quality uh, diminish because of failing infrastructure and failing best practices um, and corruption uh, in the system that made a lot of people very, very sick. Uh, Jackson, Mississippi is a more current example, even though Flint is still going on, uh, where they were losing not just quality of water, but quantity of water. We're also going to see this failing infrastructure of quantity uh, in the southwestern United States as the Colorado River will be drying up uh, and won't be able to support the 40 million people, people and the, the infrastructure of agriculture that's built around that river um, where we get a lot of our winter produce um, in the United States. Uh, so when I think about this infrastructure issue and we have different things happening, actually here in Oregon, we could list a couple of them right away. Back in 2015, 2016, we had the Portland School District had lead poisoning, which is a water quality issue. And if you look at each of 
And then in Salem, they had algae blooms that affected a lot of the Salem area and people could not be using water. And that when we get algae blooms in affecting water quality, uh, even boiling the water doesn't help. So we have a high reliance on bottled water. When we tip, when our infrastructure collapses in the United States, what happens is we get, um, and, and we fall off the cliff into chaos. Uh, our our way to go to we go to complicated to look at. Let's get the experts in here. Uh, but our really our. I would say dysfunctional best practices is just to start shipping bottled water to those areas in mass quantities, like millions, 40 million, you know, gallons upon gallons of water in plastic bottles to these areas, uh, which is definitely when we're looking at a crisis or an emergency and we have people and families and children who need water, we need to get them water right? That is a, a good way to do it. However, it is not very reliable considering the amount of collapsing water infrastructure that we will be facing in the near future, not to be too apocalyptic about it. So when I think about Kinefin, this is why complex is so valuable because when we move into complex and we create stakeholder conversations uh, that are really in places of problem solving, that means we need lots of different, you know, we've been studying complex, you know what that is. We need all those different perceptions and voices because whenever we think of water issues, we think of it being called a wicked problem. And a wicked problem is a problem that has many different causes. Uh, often when we look at problems that need to be solved, they we have a tendency to want to get into a reductive place of finding the cause that can pull us to the solution. But this is why the Kinef is so valuable because when we pull into complex, we realize that the causes could be multiple. There could be multiple things happening. Uh, and um, Kinefin is a great way to create plans, that, to, to look at problems and to try and create plans and structure for when we uh, have unfortunate, the inevitable situations of chaos or crisis coming um, into our communities. I think when I think about the water crisis for myself, I think about my family. Obviously, all of us might think about our family and our watersheds that we live in and the beautiful environments that we live in that we might want to find ways to be to develop our own plan. Just like when they say we have a disaster you, your family needs its own disaster plan or your family needs to, if there's um, an earthquake or a hurricane, uh, what will your family do? Um, do you have a plan for that? I think the same thing is for uh, water um, as water is life. And we need to make sure that we can uh, have reliable ways of taking care of that situation when we're dealing with infrastructures and bureaucratic infrastructures that are so big, they'll be, it's hard to um, make a difference in those, those situations as they roll on. But be a part of conversations, uh, ask questions, be that person in the who shows up at the city council me meeting and asks a really good question. It doesn't have to be confrontational. It doesn't have to be debate style. It can be, I have a concern about this. Um, and make sure that people, that you are the per in that complex uh, arena, that you could be the person asking the question to try to understand that helps us get to better solutions. Okay. So that's how I think of water crises. They are wicked problems. That means they have lots of causes. And because of that, 
there's going to be multiple solutions. Um, and the solutions will be different from region to region and from community to community. It's just like homelessness. Homelessness is another example of a wicked problem and why it's such a hard thing for each city and community to deal with because it's manifesting just uniquely and differently for each area. Okay, uh, uh, this, thank you, Summer Bummers. Next question, how to talk to someone uh, who in the hierarchy has more authority, a supervisor um, or someone who has more power than you uh, to understand? How to talk to someone to understand? Well, we could be just as clear as day. And if someone ain't listening, they just aren't listening, right? And that's just the way it is. <laughs> you can't really force someone to listen to you, whether they have more power than you or less power than you, whether you're the person with authority or you're talking to someone with more authority. And I think that's the first thing when I'm thinking about this question is to really let's dial it back and remember that, um, not, not everyone is listening to understand or listening to be curious. Some people are just listening to respond or there are narcissistic listeners and they're just waiting to get the mic back to tell their own story and their own solution instead of being in a dialogue or collaboration. Uh, however, when you don't have authority in an office or a situation, you can develop some tactics to be more strategic in how you deliver a message. So understanding the person you're talking to and their style, the more you work with people, the more you kind of see their patterns and what's working and not working. You need to run your own uh, experiment, I guess, in a way to see what, what might help with your um, back and forth with that person. Uh, not every one of us is fortunate to have a supervisor who really wants to dialogue and problem solve with us. Another, I think, an outside factor on the conflict of that situation is that we're often overworked, um, where we are just piled on project after project after project, and you might be trying to get oh, I need uh, you to understand that if someone asks you this question, either send them to me or send them, here's the link I need you to send them to. Don't try to answer the question yourself. There, we have the resource here, what, you know, whatever it is. Uh, that, that takes time to set up a structure that we often are so bombarded with, with work and deadlines and do this for me now and interruptions, especially the interruptions that it's hard to stay focused on really getting something like that in place so that you can develop it. So that's a real outside factor that really creates um, some problems. If you have any influence on your the time management structure where we can start rolling back how many meetings there are actually happening in an organization or uh, if we can uh, propose a situation where one day a week or one day a month is a um, project day uh, and you can set uh, time things aside for something that might need a little more attention, um, then it's always good to request that or try and see if you can get your organization to include those bigger project processes. But the question, how to talk to someone to understand, another thing you can do, which is, I hate to add another thing to your list, but when you've had a dialogue, whether it's in the meeting or a one-on-one -on -one interaction to follow up with an email that kind of out that just does a bullet point list of a few things that was discussed uh, and you keep it really concise um, and easy to read not a lot of verbiage no 
keep the context low, which I'm going to add another thought about context, uh, so that it can be referred back to. And it puts emphasis if that person was looking at their phone while you were listening or you're not sure they really engaged in the information you were trying to share with them. But brevity is always your friend. Uh, and that's really hard. If some people are much more high context, that means that when they talk, they start with the foundation of their building, and then they start building the floors, and then they get to the point, I need you to tell people to go to this website or this link if they have that question, right? That's the point. But all the reasoning and context and examples, some people build that in first before they say the action piece. And by then, people are gone. People are gone by the end. Uh, some, so our listening skills, which we've talked about before, need to be built up. And some people are conscious about doing that. But most of us uh, really struggle with even being having an awareness around how we listen. Uh, so I would say that most people are listening for 30 to 60 seconds in a conversation. That is about the most time you have to really get your most important point, boom, right out of the gate. Uh, and then after you've made the point, then be aware of nonverbals and start building in the context after that, or ask a question at the end of your point. Um, does that, is that sound clear or do, can I explain it better? Or do you, you know, like you can, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want you to be condescending or patronizing, but to really just be like, um, throw the ball back in their court on the point you're making, ask them to comment on your point. Um, and that can sometimes continue the dialogue. Most of us are dealing with over talkers. Uh, and so sometimes it's exhausting to throw the ball back into someone's court, especially once you've got the talking ball, you're like, oh my God, I'm talking to an over talker and I have the ball. Boy, I better say everything I have to say and I better get it in now. Um, but the truth is that doesn't mean just because you got the talking ball that anyone's listening. Okay, so brevity is your friend. The third question from the summer bummers. Uh, oh, actually, this was a two-part question. So this was about hybrid hybrid work. I love this question. Thank you for asking this question. Actually, I love all these questions. But this hybrid question. Uh, so I will, this is about, since we're living in hybrid kind of workplaces now in post in the pan, pandemic bubble that we're kind of in, uh, the question is about what are the best practices um, and how can we use, I'm curious uh, about how we can use the Kinefin theory to help us understand these best practices of hybrid workplaces. But a caveat is that I would say just because we were all in the office at some point or in-person workplaces doesn't mean that we had the best communication practices then as well. Uh, so I feel like this uh, kind of unfortunate crisis that we were in with COVID-19 pulling us into a more hybrid world is actually an opportunity to slide us through to figuring out, getting into that more complex or complicated place of developing the best practices. Um, and it's an opportunity to re-understand what you need. Now, uh, when we're looking, what, uh, let me just go back. So, when we were all in the office, there was different types of communication happening, which we covered week one in organizational calm. And that is informal and formal. 
um, and those grapevines that existed. And when we all got pulled into isolation, we kind of severed inform informal communication and we severed our grapevines. And who was the natural hubs of getting information? All of a sudden, those people were losing power um, with the way that they were getting information and being able to understand the kind of social networks and social situations that were going on that are not always obvious in the formal bureaucratic org, org com flow charts and the formality of, um, a, of the way communication, the organization wants communication to flow. So if informality is what we're missing, then I think in a hybrid workplace, uh, we are looking for more of those kind of uh, impromptu or informal moments. And that doesn't mean that you're not professional, which means we are not, we will always be respectful uh, in our communication practices, but informality kind of means those little types of conversations that pop up where we perception check with each other about something or get someone's opinion uh, about, um, so a decision we're trying to make or a project we're working on. So how, if we're trying to create best practices for hybrid, we almost need to pull our organization up into the complex realm. Now you could go to complicated, meaning we could go to Harvard Business Review and read articles. Uh, this is hybrid workplaces existed before. COVID-19. So there were people already developing and getting an expertise on that. And we can definitely go to complicated to get that information. However, because there's kind of a uniqueness to what's happening now in a post-COVID world, that I think the complex is to be in a probing place where you are trying to make sense of this new world, develop new hypotheses, test them, and see what starts to come out, but be in a kind of analytical place where you're asking questions and you're, and you're trying different things till you find something that feels like a place to kind of settle into. So for example, I have an example. Uh, which I'd love to hear your examples actually, because you all have been doing this as well, but I'm a professor and I was in the classroom every day, even though I had taught for eCampus and I had taught online only classes. So I had some inkling of my style on an in an online course. The dominant way I was teaching was in the classroom. That meant we, we were watching a lot of scenes from movies and TV shows. I would come into class with like five or six DVDs and worksheets and we were doing projects and moving desks around. And I have so many games. We'd be playing games. I, I love games that get us communicating, uh, collaborative games versus competitive games and stuff like that, which especially for this class, oh my gosh, if we could all meet in person, we would be playing so many games together. Uh, but that's just not the world we're in right now. And so that means I had to figure out how I can shift what I would, what I was actually trying to do with the learning outcomes through those and find different paths. So I'm still experimenting. I do take suggestions and I am listening to your uh, experiences as we move through this kind of complex situation as I'm trying to make sense of cause effect in this new COVID world, hybrid world, that my team meetings are one of the ways that I make up for losing the informality of the classroom. So yes, here I am doing a lecture. That's the formality, but stump the professor with questions and I make this video that has a, a little bit more informality to it. Uh, and also when I ask you to 
come up, come up with your own icebreaker. And there's so many innovative things happening. And each team meeting is completely different. That gives me a clue that I'm kind of on the right track with creating ways for you to connect with each other. Because to me, the classroom environment or the learning experience should be collaborative. It should not be, I will regurt, I will throw up all this information on you. And then you have to try and figure out how to sort it and then throw up your stuff back at me. And that does not sound like learning to me. So I love these dialogues and conversations. Um, and I love the opportunity to see what you're curious about so I can zoom in on those things. Okay. Uh, the second part of that, that was only the first part of that question. The second part was just kind of thrown in at the end, which is this idea of this AI and uh, which I, wow, I feel like we're in March, 2019, when I think about the way AI is shifting and changing our world, it is happening at lightning speed, which means we have tipped over into a little bit of chaos with uh, these kind of AI linguistic platform tools. So the language tools specifically, uh, which um, are out uh, like chat beat GBT, but then there's so many more of them and they all are a little bit different. So when we think about AI, we're looking at, to me, when we're tipped over into chaos, we can't really go to complicate it. Who else? We've never had a, a technology resource available to like this. And if you listen to the discussions of the people who are like um, trying to figure this out, they will often go to my teachers will talk about when Wikipedia came out and how it was uh, chaos. It tipped us into chaos on the way our students were doing research and where they were getting information um, and how we dealt with that. But I do not think that is a stable analogy for what's happening with AI uh, and, and, and so that means for me, AI has to live in complex. I want to get up in complex. I want to experiment. I want to make sense of it. I it, And I do. I am on ChatGPT and a few other different linguistic platforms. I have them open a lot and I am trying them out. I'm practicing using them. Uh, because, and I encourage, and some of you have to do that already in your workplaces. Uh, they're already being used and, um, and people who are like, no, we just need, to, we're, we tipped over into chaos. We just just shut it down. We need everything to be shut down right away and we need to create regulation and then we can open it up, uh, is not, I don't really think that's realistic. The cat's out of the bag. I don't think we can get this cat back in the bag. Um, especially there are a lot of people who are making a lot of money, um, on these platforms. And when we look at a consumer society, money usually becomes a driver for us keep on moving forward with things. Um, so I say, experiment a little, try it out, because you want to be part of that complex discussion. You want to be the person in the room who, who uh, wants to experiment and figure out the best practices. So to me, when I think about AI, I think about ethics. What are the ethics uh, about how are we approaching our own writing experience, uh, the way that we represent ourselves? Uh, I definitely, I, can, I don't mind giving my own opinion that face um, technology, uh, AI and deep fake videos or face use AI, I think should, um, is very problematic. Your face is your face. Uh, but we also need to have dialogues and figure out about copyrights and things like that as well for the written word. Um, and I think the music industry, um, because they have had a lot of court cases about copyright and 
how to look at music uh, and different measures of music, I think that will often, that might be where some of these lawyers use AI to um, make their point about copyright. So it'll be curious. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe my answer would be di will be different in six months. I think it's moving that fast. But at this moment in time, that's my answer. Um, or my thoughts on it, I should say. I don't really have an answer. Uh, and I'm definitely not an expert in it. Okay. So moving on to team two, the next team, Wolf Squad. Hello, Wolf Squad. Uh, thank you for your great questions. Uh, let me, let's get into it. At what point is risk-taking counterproductive? Yeah, we do hear a, a lot about taking risks. Um, and we think about risk-taking and creativity, but when is it counterproductive? So there needs to be a balance between that. And I think when I think about the balance of taking risks to um, being in best practices and always staying obvious, that's also... I think extremely risky um, as opposed to being over here in a more uh, random place of risk taking. I think of this as a dialectical tension. So a dialectical tension uh, is when there's things that are too polar opposite of each other, but they can't exist at the same time. Um, exist in, uh, my, my favorite example is like, oh, I wanna go visit Santa at the North Pole, or do I want to visit penguins at the South Pole? Well, I want to go but uh, to visit, but I can't see Santa and penguins at the same time, right? So that's a dialectical tension of the pole, opposite poles. Uh, so when we think about this, we're looking for balance, right? We're looking for a place of balance where we can um, try and find ways to put priorities on both of these. You need predictability. You need, to, the, some people need predictability even more depending on their past experiences. So when we've had experiences of trauma or a crisis um, or tragedy, things like this, that often we'll want to lean more into predictability. So we'll talk more in this kind of catastrophe, what if language, like, well, what if this happens or what if this happens? Because we're trying to control the unknown and move towards this kind of, and wanna to move towards wanting predictability in our lives. Um, so when you hear someone saying, what if, what if, what if, what if, I'm guilty of that as well. Um, I have uh, my own issues that makes me want to lean into predictability uh, and patterns, but we do know that shuts down creativity. So how do we pull ourselves into a place that can, for some people need to feel a little bit safer as they take some risks? So that can be in embedded into the structure of a schedule so the schedule becomes the predictability part of it. And then we create windows where we are going to, um, actually there's a Big Bang Theory episode where, I don't, I forget which season it is, where Penny and Leonard and Sheldon are tr trying to figure out what to do one Thursday night. And Leonard says, why don't we bring back anything can happen Thursday. So apparently at some point in their past, because Sheldon likes everything to be very predictable, it's pizza night, it's Thai food night, it's halo night, right? He has this very strict schedule uh, where he wants everything predictable, but apparently they had built in one day a week where something different can happen. And that's one way to create risk in a, a much more controlled kind of environment. Now, um, for some, some people, they really have, those schedules feel really oppressive. Having everything predictable, we do know kind of shuts down motivation. It shuts down creativity. It can feel like drudgery, like that groundhog day. I got up and I had the same day again and again and again. 
and pulling into risk-taking is energizing. And we need that novelty. We need spontaneity. Uh, and this is what's difficult when you're in a management or supervisor position is you're managing people who have very different ways that they uh, experience time. And you want to make room for if your group um, especially depending on what your group is and what you're doing, you might need more room for taking risks. So this is creating, which I'm sure all of you can come up with this answer. I've listened to your team meetings. You're all saying it. You need to have places where failure is okay, um, making mistakes. Um, obviously, we don't want to fail the business and we don't want to lose a lot of money. So those things need boundaries to them. Uh, so when I think about the answer for this, it's really the culture of risk taking um, and the culture of predictability. And how are you managing the dialectical tension of those two things? All right. Oh, my God. The second question here is a really big one. Uh, so the second question from the Wolf Squad Thank you very much for asking this really important question. Uh, is about gender and communication. So gender and communication, one of my favorite topics, uh, is a really complicated one. I actually, I'm going to try and keep it brief, but I don't think I can. Um, actually, I'm going to set a little timer here on my side just to track me so I don't get too out of control. So when we talk about gender, we are definitely in a transitional place in our society where the definition of gender and how people perceive gender as being binary and non-binary uh, as existing on a spectrum. So when I talk about gender in this little tiny answer that I'm gonna give, it's not gonna be too tiny, uh, just to put a caveat on it that I'll say feminine speech and masculine speech but those are existing on a spectrum and they are not tied to our birth gender identity or um or the or the the performance gender that we we are performing uh, these are just patterns, linguistic cultural patterns that some people fall into and diff and feminine speech and masculine speech uh, can uh, happen in can be more contextual to environments. So the business world, because it's so male dominated, dominated and set up by male, um, more patriarchal uh, society, we find more masculine speech patterns in the business world, uh, and. However, and feminine speech, we find um, more dominant in home life, but not always, uh, because that was where more matriarch power existed for some cultures, and it really depends on the situation. So I'll use my own family, blended family, as example, that my husband, we're a blended family, so my husband's and he and his kids, the mother left the family. Uh, and that was at a time when the older sisters had moved out as well, where they had more feminine speech culture at that point. But once my husband became the dominant parent and he had more sons in the mix, even though he had one younger daughter still at home, they even the younger daughter, they all speak in more masculine speech patterns. Where I once had a student who was um, used he pronouns born male at birth. He grew up in a home with a mother, an aunt and a grandmother, multi-generations living in one home. And he was the only boy in the house. And he never understood why he could never really fit in in his friend groups until my lecture. And he's like, oh, I've been doing feminine speech when masculine speech was needed. And that's why he felt so outside and alone uh, because he grew up in a really dominant feminine speech culture house. 
So this is really important. I, I haven't even told you what it is yet, but I really think it's really important to put this preamble at the beginning of telling you about gender and communication because I don't want this to be labels of men talk this way and women talk this way. That's not really what we're looking at. Um, okay. Most of this research comes from Deborah Tannen, which you can find a lot of videos about her um, and watch her talk about this as well. So some of my examples come from her. So in feminine speech, feminine speech is about keeping everything the same, that if I share something, the other person has to share something in reciprocity of equal value. Uh, and we need to always keep up the appearances that we're all equal and we're all the same. This is the dominant force and prime directive of feminine speech. And feminine speech non-verbally happens when we're facing each other, when we're making eye contact. Even though uh, often for us to listen better, we do actually cast our eyes downward. In feminine speech, we'll be facing more face-to-face -face, and there'll be more looking up and nodding and more ahas and, you know, sounds, oh, mm, really? Things like that. Uh, and that is one of the ways that we listen in feminine speech. In masculine, way over on the other side of the spectrum, uh, masculine speech culture is about creating hierarchies. So often if when there's a dialogue, when someone does reciprocity, we're supposed to move up the ladder uh, and then the other person will come in with something and someone else will come up with something until we get to the end of the conversation with who knew what and who has the last word and who's going to put that final boom on it. And masculine speech moves this way. Feminine speech stays this way. I shared is this, you're going to share this. And so what that kind of sounds like is because we're here, we're trying to stay equal and here we're creating a ladder. Uh, here it'll sound like, I like your, wow, I really liked that report you gave. Uh, oh, well, I really uh, couldn't have done it unless you hadn't given me those facts, right? So if there's if someone gives a compliment in feminine speech, that means someone goes up. And alarm bells in feminine speech world, oh my God, someone can't be better than somebody else. So that person who went up will do a repair statement. And the repair statement is either to bring the other person up or what most likely will happen is bring themselves down. Um, and this is why we hear a lot of disparaging talk in feminine speech, like, oh, it was no big deal. Oh, but there was so much trouble. Wah, 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 wah. Right? And depending on how big the compliment is or how big the success is, uh, how big the award is, you might actually get what, you might not just lower yourself to be equal, you might lower yourself much farther down. Uh, that would be counterproductive in masculine speech. Masculine speech is, I know this. Oh, well, I already knew that. And I know this. Oh, I knew that too. And I know this. And I knew that. And I know this. And I knew this. And I knew this. Um, right. I caught a fish this big. Oh, well, I caught a fish this big. Well, I caught a fish this big. I kicked the ball to the fence over there. Well, I kicked the ball over the fence. Well, I kicked the ball over the fence and it hit a window. Well, I kicked the ball over the fence and it went all the way to the moon. Whoa, to the moon. We're done. End the conversation. You win. Right. So there's this kind of um, almost hyperbole that starts happening in masculine speech. Uh, to get to the end. And conversations in masculine speech are, as we talked about, I think in our listening, another video, conversation video, is to get to the point, to get to the end. Um, it's that instrumental talk like chess. I'm going to eliminate things and we're going to get to the end. Boom, mission accomplished. Where feminine speech is expressive, it's more emo it has more emotion statements kind of included in it. And the conversation doesn't really have an ending. It just keeps opening and opening and opening. Now, feminine speech puts a lot of emphasis on problem talk. Problem talk, meaning that I have to 
actually have to empty up a problem I'm having. And now I have to empty up another person's, uh, or I have, I, the reciprocity is the pressure to empty up a problem as well. And if I don't have a problem, then I'm going to empty up someone else's problem. And this is why Brené Brown says, where's the vault? Because feminine speech has this expansive thing and so much pressure, pressure to self-disclose that we often self-disclose other people's issues as well. And that the vault part of her braving trust acronym uh, reminds us culturally that some things should not be self-disclosed that are not ours to self-disclose. Um, and so there's a lot of pressures here. The punishment in both of these worlds are huge if you do not follow the rules, the cultural rules of, in feminine speech, the pressures is to be left out, to be isolated, uh, to not get information. So who knew who, what, when is a really big pressure in feminine speech cultures and families with um, often deal with this, like especially with a lot of siblings, there's a lot of competition to get information or to know information and to be the one to reveal information because there are hierarchies in feminine speech. Um, they're just hidden hierarchies and the hierarchies are implicit in who has secrets who knows information and who knew it first. And when you're not even getting the information at all, you're not even invited to the birthday party anymore. You are in a place um, in feminine speech that is considered the punishment for not obeying these feminine, these implicit feminine speech rules, cultural rules. In masculine speech, there's establishing a hierarchy. Who's and this kind of patriarch that there's an alpha and then there's a ladder and that could be squashed pretty low. It doesn't mean just because we have a hierarchy that there isn't respect. And, and I'm just saying that more from a feminine speech world, we look over there and go, oh my God, there's a hierarchy. How are you all respecting each other? No, no. Um, the hierarchy is one of the ways that we create respect uh, and show appreciation for each other. Um, I have so much to say about that, um, but just to mirror this. So once we, when we establishing the hierarchy, uh, the punishment over here is not to be left out in masculine speech world. Everybody's invited to the party. Everybody's invited to the meeting. Everyone's invited to the retreat because you can't have the top unless you have the bottom. And so the way we the structure is created is through orders and teasing and razzing. So order, will you do this? Oh, no, you need to do this. No, you need to do this. And it's sometimes why we feel a little bristle when someone gives us an order because it's establishing this height. It's this kind of an invisible world of how hierarchies and status are created. Uh, and then teasing and razzing uh, can either turn into bullying and become really toxic and dysfunctional, or it can be the way that we show respect. Oh my gosh, what a fine line with communication, right? So, um, and we get that by whoever's at the top, whoever is in the kind of top alpha positions, if they're the only one doing the teasing and the teasing is going down, the ladder, and no one's allowed to tease up the ladder of the hierarchies, that's when we're in a really dysfunctional place, when it's top-down teasing. Uh, and, but, so one way to think about this is with parenting styles. So if you had a masculine speech parent uh, who was more dysfunctional, teasing the parent was teasing the kid, I'm going to toughen you up, I'm going to tease you, I'm going to razz you, because it's a bad world out there. And if we don't strengthen you up, how are you going to survive, right? Where when teasing, but some parents allow teasing upwards, 
They allow the kids to play a joke on the parents and it's all, there's some kind of fun and games in the back and forth. And that type of structure kind of squashes the hierarchy. Uh, that movie, American Sniper, um, really shows, even though we have the snipe, the American Sniper being the best at what he does, he allows teasing upward quite a bit. Um, the Marines he works with tease him relentlessly, and he allows it, even though it's in a really strict masculine culture. Um, and what he's trying to do is pull the high hierarchy. He's squashing the ladder down. He's not getting rid of it. He's not over here, but he wants to lower the to show respect. He wants to lower the distance, the power distance. That's the word I was looking for. So masculine speech has all this pressure all day long. Do I have information? Am I giving an order or taking an order? Uh, is there teasing or razzing? What's going on over here? Right. So language is the way the hierarchy is established um, and how we are engaged in those conversations. Uh, and so masculine speech gets home and goes, ah, phew, I don't have to talk anymore. I can just be myself. I don't have to prove myself. Finally, I'm home and I don't have to take orders from every, anyone. I'm just going to sit here and relax. And shut up. Feminine speech has this pressure all day long. I have to be careful what I say. <clears throat> I better be careful. Oh my gosh. I don't want to seem better than anybody else. I better not. I have all this pressure to allow other people room and I got to pay a compliment or I got to put myself down and feminine speech gets home and goes, oh my God, you won't believe what happened to me today. And I'm going to go through every single conversation that I had in every single moment. And I'm going to tell you what happened. And oh my gosh, this happened and this happened and this happened. And this person said this, and this is what I said, but this is what I was thinking. And this is what I would have said if I could have said what I really wanted to say. And problem talk in the home. Honey, how was your day? Same old, same old stuff. <gasps> That doesn't sound like reciprocity. I just poured out my heart and soul of every breathing moment of my day. And all you have to do is tell me it was the same old day. That's not reciprocity in feminine speech world. Meanwhile, you didn't even get, give me eye contact when I was talking. How do I know you're even listening to me? Uh, where masculine speech does not need, doesn't use eye contact for listening. In fact, they masculine speech nonverbal is to face outward and to not do eye contact and be side by side during really intense self-disclosure. Um, so these are really important invisible kind of structures in gender communication world. Um, and I have so many interesting examples from students over the years. I'd love to hear your examples about the way this shows up for you. Oops, I need a little water. One student of mine, I loved this example so much. He was living with several other men as he was going to the university. And one of his friends, something happened and he was having, he was slipping into depression. He was becoming more isolated. And no matter how many times that my student reached out to him and say, Hey dude, what's going on? What's, what's happening with you? Are you okay? He'd always get a really everything. Yeah. Eh, nothing. You know, you get these kind of little snippets of without any self-disclosure. So then he heard this lecture on gender communication and he went home and he asked his roommate if he wanted to play a video game with him. So they put a videotape, they put a video, he put the video game into the player and he put his friend's favorite game in that he plays all the time. And he's about five or 10 minutes into the game and he asked him, hey dude, what's going on? The same question he had been asking for weeks and not getting anything. And they were sitting side by side playing the game and this guy started saying what was happening and talking about his problems. And 
his he was able to really help his friend out. Um, and it's a real clue of how understanding how communication work um, and understanding communication theory and putting it into action in the real world can really, really make a difference. Um, and he was able to make a difference. And it's one of my favorite stories um, coming out of this lecture. All right. So again, that research comes a lot from Deborah Tannen's work. And I have, I could, I literally, when, um, when I teach another class, interpersonal communication, I, I can devote two to three days just on gender communication. So if you found this topic interesting and want to learn more or have a discussion with me, um, or I can point you to some resources, let me know. All right. Um, Wolf Squad. Uh, let's see, I'm looking at the next question. Can an individual's response to fear, how to mitigate this fear in leadership choices? Oh, okay. And this actually pulls us into one of the questions from Common Grounds as well. But basically, how do people people's response to the unknown? And how do you, if you are a leader, how are you mitigating um the fear of the unknown. And I think it's really just, it's not just, it, this is a really big issue. When you have someone in charge, they are going to want to stay in that best practices, like I talked about, that predictability that comes with what's obvious and um, take less risks. Uh, and then we could lose productivity, we could lose motivation, we can lose creativity. Um, and how do you mitigate that fear? Well, uh, I think with this kind, with the answer for this, it's it's a complex answer, uh, and I think no, you could get a lot of different answers for this from a lot of different people, and it's going to be driven by context, and each person is different. So I'm not going to have a great answer that's going to fit every situation, right? We have to be really pull ourselves into that observer role or pull ourselves into that role of um, listening um, to understand. Uh, but if we're trying to mitigate a fear for a leader, that would go back to my, this is where I said there were some overlapping your questions to the Wolf Squad's question. I would just say, see what I said about risk-taking and that dialectical tension, uh, that you can create structures around taking risks um, uh, or unknown moments to help us better uh, face those. But the more we understand the way, the patterns we've established in our own lives and do radical acceptance that we actually cannot control moment to moment as much as we want to um, control uh, or be able to predict the future. That's not predictable. Uh, it, though there is some randomness to the universe um, and each step that we step forward is a brand new moment and we should show up for that. And actually we see that some cultures really understand the future differently and see change differently. Um, and unfortunately in Western culture, it's a little bit of a crutch that we have this belief structure that um, things are not changing. Uh, other cultures have a much different, some cultures have a much different understanding of change and how each moment is always changing and things are always, and there's a, things are different. Um, so I think th that if you are to embrace yourself as a leader is to really start understanding your own structures and fear of the unknown and how you accept change. Um, I wouldn't really, um, until you know where you're at with it, it's going to be really difficult to ask someone else to accept change and the and differences. Okay, I probably have more to say about that, 
but I'm just going to pause for now before I go into the next part of the video because I know I've been talking for a minute. So I'll be right back. All right, as promised, here we are, common grounds. This first question, how do you get Bartleby's to say yes, which is a reference to a short story. Uh, who's this? But Bartleby the Scrivener, A Story of Wall Street by Herman Melville. Uh, so this story is really an, 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 an a metaphor or an allegory of how workplaces become oppressive. And so we're really looking at one worker in a system where things are very repetitive. There's no creativity. A Scribner, he basically is someone who writes um, before copy machines and makes copies of other people's work. And that's what he's doing day in and day out. And I think there's this story is about isolation. It's that Groundhog Day kind of story. And if we were to use this as an allegory for understanding modern leadership or understanding a modern workplace, we really want to think about all these things we're learning in this class as the way to help Bartleby. Bart Bartleby. So the question is, how do you get Bartleby to say yes? Because in the question, he repeats throughout the short story, I would prefer not to. He says no a lot. So how do we get him to yes? Is we need to get him in um, really more feedback, uh, more recognition, which we've talked about in class. How do you recognize people's contributions? Uh, how do you include them, right? So this story is really about the beginning of that kind of bureaucratic industrial revolution. And we know now that classical management structures that are top down and really put workers as tools um, to, uh, to be wrung out, as Simon Sinek says, to be towels, to be wrung out every ounce of them, uh, that we, what are we giving back to Bartleby? What, how is he being included um, in that kind of human resources approach to, or uh, human relations, I actually think human relations approach to engaging him in conversations about his experience in the workplace, finding out what does he need? Is his desk uh, the right type of desk for the work? Does he have the supplies? Does he have a different supply uh, request that we could help him have to uh, even just, um, or changing up one, one day a week or one month, one day a month, uh, are we giving him room to create something of his own? Um, so he has that feeling of, of creativity. And also, I guess I'd be curious about if there's ways we can make him understand that if we go from the ecosystem approach of what his contribution is doing, how is it serving others? How does it have purpose? Um, and connecting it to that. We definitely were coming up on burnout and vacations and stress and dealing with stress. I think with Bartleby, we could help him with some stress reduction. Uh, so he is, um, not feeling so shut down that he can no longer say yes to things because he has, uh, he's just, his cup is full and it's full of other people's things and not his own. So we need to get him to see more of his purpose in this workplace. Okay, so that's my answer for that. Uh, the second question is how do you move from complicated to complex? And I think this kind of, ties into other things we've been talking about from Summer Bummers and Wolf Squad. And if we're in complicated, it means that there's already someone who knows the path, that we have a team of experts. However, if we want to move into complex, it means we need 
to um, read, decide that the problem is unique, that there is something about this that is different from all other problems. And if we're moving into comp from complicated to complex, it's, a, it's recognizing how different the situation is. Uh, that there are that all the expertise in the world can't help help us really develop a solution, and that we need to kind of start from scratch a little bit. And how do you make room for that in an organization when things are already in the the, the machinery is moving? Uh, so I would say how you make room for complex is this is where task force comes into place or you do a retreat, a special retreat just to work on this one issue. Things like that are ways that you would move into um, complex from complicated. Okay, Common Grounds asks a third question. The CEO or the founder of a group um, uh, is making the main decisions, they're active in the organization, but their mindset has has kind of landed in the obvious and um, they're not allowing for risk. So we're back in that dialectical tension of risk to predictability. So the CE, a CEO or a founder or someone who gets to the success of being able to have an organization has had a lot of failure. They are not a stranger to risk. Right. And then they found the one thing where the formula worked and they were able to really propel forward. So really, I feel like this question about how do you move a CEO or founder into to allow for risk uh, is really about. How do you remind them that failure is OK? Um, and sometimes there's a lot more at stake. Uh, there's maybe millions of dollars at stake. Okay, so there is a movie about this, and it's a good movie. Uh, that movie Air that j came out recently about Michael Jordan and Nike and the development of the Jordan shoe, uh, the Air brand that and Ben Affleck plays Phil Knight, the CEO, founder of Nike, and Matt Damon's character comes to him and tells him he wants to take this huge risk with this new upcoming athlete, Michael Jordan, and he has a, a new strategy, uh, but if it doesn't work, it's going to be a big failure for the company. Um, it might actually completely eliminate an entire department of Nike shoes. Uh, and we all know, of course, watching the movie that he will not fail. And we will have one of this great shoe come out of Nike. Uh, however, in the moment, he has to convince the CEO to take this big risk. And it's a really, really difficult thing to do. So I think this question is really interesting because it's a thing. It's a thing that happens. Um, and so you could uh, look to that. But I think when we're thinking about taking risks or are, are we too, are things, um, have we gotten to a place that we could really be in a destructive place with taking risks? or are things too predictable and trying to manage those dialectical tensions, you really wanna understand the organization as a whole. So when the founder was taking risks, they may have been the only person, or they may have had a very small team of people and they knew all the informal conversations and micro stories that were coming out of all those failures to develop where they are now. And when we're at a much bigger organizational level, the power distance becomes so big that the person at top loses track of all those macro stories and micro stories that are happening um, and how to gauge where risk should happen. So I think for a CEO or founder, um, they need a little undercover boss 
kind of action, just to draw on that reality <laughs> TV show, that that can be a really great indicator of um, getting it back into the trenches and listening to those stories and seeing if we need a little more risk or do we need more predictability? Um, and I've heard several of you talk about this in your team meetings uh, about building trust, that how we build trust and transparency and where can we find our leaders, right? I like to be careful and not say that a supervisor is necessarily a leader, uh, we can find leaders at all different levels of an organization. And uh, being uh, tuned into the social networks and those formal pathways, but informal communication pathways can help us um, navigate that. All right. That was a long video. Thank you for your patience. And I hope uh, I really enjoyed answering your questions and listening to your team meetings. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, what's coming up for us this term. Bye, everyone.